Uh, my talk will be somewhat less technical than uh, the previous ones. Uh, I'm, my background, I'm an uh, engineering economist, so I've worked for many years in trying to look at the costs of various energy projects uh, in addition to their uh, technical feasibility. Uh, in this talk, I'm kind of going to try to retain the uh, conference objectives of some thought-provoking ideas. Uh, boundless optimism here might be a little hard. Remember that I'm an economist, and there's a good reason they call economics the dismal science. <laughs> and I'll also be, you know, looking at things that, you know, this uh, future that one day might be in humanity's grasp. Most of what I'll talk about will deal more with maybe interplanetary missions uh, than uh, interstellar, since my, most of my background is nuclear. Uh, and I'm assuming that the uh, technology for interstellar space travel does not yet exist. So many of the examples I use are going to be uh, for the uh, missions within the solar system. Okay, as an example of something that is more current, I'm going to use geoengineering uh, as an example. Both uh, interstellar uh, space flight, interplanetary space flight, and geoengineering both require extensive national and international consensus and huge resources. Both will be, both will be hugely expensive. We're talking about terabytes or uh, trillions of dollars. Both are going to be driven by long-term concerns regarding the survival of uh, nations and even the human race. Now, consideration of geoengineering is already a reality. Uh, we can look at several uh, different areas. One is the reduction of the effects of climate change, that is adaptation. It looks like the uh, greenhouse gas levels are increasing so fast, we're probably going to have a very difficult time getting it back down to the point we uh, negate the effects. So we're going to have to look more at adaptation rather than uh, stopping it. So uh, it, there are some methods for reduction. And these also are going to require huge resources and uh, huge changes in the earth. Another one is the development of new water supply uh, as a result of prolonged drought in a lot of areas, and this may itself be climate-induced. Uh, okay, what are some of the problems we're running into, or institutional problems, uh, in doing this? For example, <coughs> climate change, we're already encountering many political barriers. Uh, stakeholders and all this are realizing that the solutions may impact their personal or national wealth. And another is that climate change may beneficially impact some nations and significantly damage others. For example, as, the, as we warm, some areas like Canada and Russia are actually going to have better conditions for agriculture. But the uh, nations that will be most negatively impacted will be those mostly in the third world, closer to the equator where the uh, drought conditions are expected to increase and the uh, temperatures to rise uh, significantly. Also, some of the uh, lesser developed high carbon nations uh, will cannot afford the trillions of dollars that will be required to do to shift to new technology or to uh, enact carbon capture and sequestration. An example is India. These countries are developing, they're burning carbon. They want to bring their people up to a higher standard of living. They can't afford the huge costs, for example, for carbon uh, capture and sequestration, which is likely to add 30 uh, percent or more to the cost of producing electricity uh, from those sources. Now, the driving force for uh, climate change uh, related geoengineering is already reasonably clear. And uh, there is scientific consensus in general that there is global warming and that. Uh, I think the real question and the problem is that the people are starting to realize the huge changes in resources, uh, financial resources, that need to fix this. But by and large, there's uh, scientific consensus. Now, one of the arguments against this is uh, uh, the huge uh, cost. For example, a little chart down in the lower right shows that you know, cap and trade will cost somewhere in the order of $1.9 trillion. They compare this to other things like the New Deal, which costs 500 billion. I mean, these are in today's dollars, so inflation is in here. Uh, Hurricane Katrina's cost for about 150 billion. NASA, since its inception, has spent 851 billion. 
and the Vietnam War costs close to 700 billion. So the, the costs will be huge. problem, uh, some other political barriers, and this is how to sell this uh, to the public and politicians when a significant proportion of the world is still uh, underdeveloped. Also with interplanetary uh, planetary and interstellar flight, the benefits to humanity are less clear. There, uh, there will be fewer people uh, that will benefit, so this makes it a particularly hard sell. Also resource sharing between nations is very difficult to implement. Uh, we have had some successes, the International uh, Space Station, in disarmament, but believe me, it is not easy to get uh, the, the work started uh, and to manage these kinds of projects. I have worked myself on some disarmament projects on plutonium disposition, and uh, this takes many years to get a project going because of the difference <coughs> in cultures, the difference in uh, business practices, and so forth, and we've run into this uh, a lot with uh, de dealing with the uh, Russians. And there are many who feel that human and financial resources should be spent on sustainable development uh, and lower growth than on the technical fixes such as geoengineering or large-scale manned uh, space, space flight. I got on the web and looked at some of these and uh, it's interesting that uh, most of the people who are against this sort of thing are, ac are academics in the liberal arts, uh, religious leaders, and uh, leaders of undeveloped countries who take this view. I thought it was interesting to find out where the sources of these views came from. And many are skeptical even of advanced geoengineering and uh, you know, also feel that space flight is really in the science fiction category. And then there are also pessimists who say, well, why do we even want to go somewhere else and mess up our planet like we did ours? <clears throat> now, some other issues are human uh, health issues. I'm not going to go into any of these details because I think there's another speaker who will do this, but uh, we have to deal with uh, zero gravity. And there are engineering solutions possible to this, but we know that bone degradation Loss of muscular strength and vision effects are there. We've seen this from previous missions. Uh, radiation is a serious problem, but there are uh, engineering solutions possible. Uh, cosmic rays on a long mission uh, could be fatal. And also, to sh when you shield these, you have to avoid getting uh, secondary radiation effects from spallation. There are also psychological problems on a long mission. Uh, there are problems with food supply, waste product disposal, and recycle. Uh, this idea of hibernation, like in the movie 2001, this right now is still uh, science fiction. We're not there yet. Uh, there's an interesting book, uh, by the way, Packing for Mars. It discovers uh, some of these, and it's uh, actually a rather entertaining book uh, by Barry Roach. So. Okay, public risk perception could be uh, a significant barrier to future uh, space flight. I know this from being in the nuclear uh, business. Now, nuclear thermal propulsion from low Earth orbit is really the only uh, feasible uh, method of sending large masses beyond the orbit of Mars. And uh, most technology uh, exists from the ABCs work in the late 1940s to 1970s. You get the high specific impulse, and actually after Apollo, NASA envisioned uh, nuclear thermal propulsion for a virus mission. At the bottom is shown uh, the spaceship from uh, Discovery from the 2001 movie. So at that time, this was looked at as the next uh, big thing. Now, there's two risks that cause uh, concern to both NASA and the public. <coughs> First, you need to launch a nuclear reactor into low Earth orbit using chemical rockets. So this would scare a lot of people. However, in reality, using uranium that has not yet been irradiated would actually be less radioactive than a plutonium-38 uh, reactor or, or uh, sources we put up there now. Also, the fuel for uh, the, the NTP reactor is a form of highly enriched uranium, or HU, which is the same material uh, used in some nuclear weapons. So you would, hey, you would now be handling this throughout the uh, mission. 
And this was, uh, we re, uh, NASA re-examined nuclear power for space applications in the early 2000s. And I worked somewhat at Oak Ridge on this Jimbo mission. Eventually, the uh, joint uh, R&D program with DOE was dropped. And it was determined that the cost of a space reactor demonstration was very high. We can't do like we did back in the uh, 1960s and 70s where you go out in the desert set up one of these rockets on a stand and run that. I mean, that time they actually discharged the uh, exhaust with small amounts of fission products uh, onto the desert. Uh, now you would have to, you'd have to do this in some sort of build, building with cleanup. We determined that just a demonstration of this would probably be in the tens of billions of dollars. Also handling this highly enriched uranium would have a huge impact on NASA operations now you get into a situation where you have to have guns, gates, and guards, and high security. And also, space nuclear power is a pretty hard sell to the public. And uh, I know NASA has experienced protests just over the launch of spacecraft using PU-238, such as the uh, Cassini mission. However, I understand this last one was just launched. I didn't, I didn't hear about any protests, but I'm sure if we launch a nuclear reactor, there will be some. Now, uh, we look at just the using nuclear power on Earth. A significant part of the developed world, the world already opposed to terrestrial nuclear power, which is actually easier, and would probably oppose space <coughs> nuclear power. For example, most of Europe, Taiwan, and now Japan are going to move away from nuclear. A lot of this is because of the safety concerns from the Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima accidents. And there's also concern about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. In fact, you have uh, use HEU now as the reactor fuel <coughs> proliferation risk. So if we're going to have an international mission, nuclear mission, we're probably going to need to involve some international agency, such as the IAEA, to regulate uh, this. I'm going to move on a little bit to economics. The, our, our research development demonstration will be very expensive. The, uh, nuclear rocket program in the 50s and 70s kind of threw a few billion dollars, that is in today's dollars. We think new regulations in R will make this R&D at least an order of magnitude higher. So we're talking about tens of billions to get to something we can launch. But in the long term, however, the nuclear propulsion might be the less expensive. We have a very high energy to mass ratio of about 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, higher than 10 to the fuels. This is important since launch, launch costs are high. And some of these uh, outer conditions will be too far from the sun for photo photovoltaics. Now, the solar cell certainly may be a possibility. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, nuclear power may not be sufficient for interstellar uh, space flight. Now, the mission costs will be high. That's, if we look at Apollo, they spent around $20 billion. That's just 10 year dollars. And the Mars mission, would cost with the base is going to be in the hundreds of billions. And one nation is very unlikely to be able to uh, bear all costs, especially if we continue to have worldwide economic problems. <coughs> Launch costs right now, the latest I've seen to low Earth orbit are around $10,000 per kilogram, and to geosynchronous Earth orbit are around $20,000 plus. And these are for chemical rockets and ground to space. Now, there are some advanced concepts that could reduce this cost significantly. Uh, the space elevator, this is a, a concept uh, where you have in geosynchronous of orbit uh, the end of a, uh, a tether, and you can actually send that material up the tether. Uh, this was one of uh, Arthur Clark's ideas. Uh, See, so one study that calculates $50 a gram. Uh, another is a mass driver space catapult that uses electromagnetic fields to propel uh, the spacecraft uh, partway. Uh, into orbit. And the study I looked at on the internet had a similar uh, dollars per kg cost, the space element. Okay, what are some future occurrences to boost the prospects for interstellar space flight? Uh, well, it looked like they're going to be an uh, eventual catastrophic collision of the Earth with an asteroid or comet. Uh, that certainly would get people more interested in this. And uh, uh, Stephen Hawking recently said we need this kind of insurance for human survival. How others, like Alan Booth, who's another physicist, says we might be better off with a giant underground bunker in the Antarctic. Also, if we have some sort of contact with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence, that would certainly uh, cause more interest in some sort of interstellar mission. 
Uh, catastrophic climate change. One idea here is the uh, space mirrors. Others, there, are, there could be other scientific breakthroughs that would make this uh, more technically feasible and less expensive, such as anti-gravity or new energy sources, antimatter, helium free fusion. Also, if there's some perceived military application, we have to remember that a lot of the Apollo mission was done for diplomatic and uh, military uh, reasons. Also, some other just more general, non-technical arguments for interplanetary, interstellar spaceflight. But this is a human endeavor in the uniting all Earth's nations. Uh, and also that exploration of the unknown is a trait of intelligent beings, including us. And this uh, study is a, uh, this kind of mission. And Carl Sagan also discussed this in his books as an argument for SETI, one being this uh, pale blue dot argument that we're, you know, let's, uh, that somehow we think there's other intelligence out there right now. We're kind of alone, but it would be good to think that there's somebody else out there like us. Also, for some, the space exploration is going to be a, considered almost a religious quest. That is, a search for a higher power or higher intelligence. And, uh, and this is looked at science fiction a lot. This, this is more of looking for a non-personal or uh, non-judgmental type of God that uh, Spinoza talked about in some of his uh, works. And that there might be in other ideas that there's a superior race of, uh, uh, race of beings or overlords. There are also, uh, in this interstellar space flight, some mythic, uh, mythic and poetic possibilities for the arts can inspire uh, a lot of things. Also, it can be a stimulus for education, especially science and uh, math education. And uh, science fiction uh, has dealt with a lot of these. 2001 looked at this transcendent evolution idea. Uh, there's a mechanical for legalists. Uh, kind of pessimistic and talked about humans playing a nuclear holocaust. Uh, the Sparrow considered a mission by Jesuit priest in Alpha Centauri after they heard this divine music signal. There's some other examples there. So in conclusion, it's going to be a hard sell in today's uh, world, even in rich nations. Uh, geoengineering will be easier to sell since the benefits are more apparent and in the near term. But the argument that man has needs to explore his lot of merits. It's a unifying concept and it counters this nihilistic argument that man is just a speck in a harsh and infinite universe. And there are some international cooperation successes. We managed to get a uh, protocol on the ozone layer and on the non and nuclear non-proliferation. But however, things may have to get bad before we can move on to technological solutions. And that's it. Uh, this is about my uh, email address or things on there. Anybody have any questions? We've got to jump start this somewhere. We need some, some entry points, some, some small demonstrations that was a good payback. And part of this is, is, is writing that speculation and talking about it. But the question keeps coming up, are there entry points for forgetting? Entry points to the process of building. <coughs> Did you come across any of that? Any <coughs> okay, uh, these are entry are there, points. Are, to, I'm sorry. Are there entry points are, to you start exploration small before you go big, okay. and development? Can we not invest twenty trillion or one billion? Can we invest five hundred dollars? Can we invest twenty thousand? Twenty thousand would buy us uh, one kilogram in orbit. But, but uh, can we show the payback from that? It's commensurate with a larger investment. I feel a lot of our robotic missions actually are providing a pretty large payback. I mean, we've learned an awful lot about the universe in the last you know, 50 years just from our space missions. I mean, personally, I feel it's wonderful. It's well worth what we spent. I'm not sure others uh, all feel this way. I remember talking to my sister once about this. You know, she wondered, why are we spending all this money to send things to Mars? You know, I have to argue with this is exciting, this is a new knowledge. I don't know that this is necessarily the way I want to see it go, but um, even in, in, in Sagan's movie Contact and at last, you talk about this somewhat in some of your books, the valuable resources that are like out in, in um, the asteroid belt, 
learning how to mine or finding, uh, you know, whatever the resource is, whether it's diamonds or gold or, or something that um, the major money structures of the world would find very interesting to get a hold of. Maybe that's a way to put it and say, we can get out there, you have a, a, a major reward, you can find a cheap way to get out there and mine this type of stuff, and then reap the benefits off of what they have developed just so they can get their own game. Right, yeah, it's gonna be important when we bring down the cost of getting there and getting it back. Otherwise, it'll be if, if you go with large companies who are after their own incentive, then hopefully, you know, trickle down doesn't always work. But if, if they come up with the development, think that they'll get the greater reward, then we can read what they develop. With, uh, you know, my co-authors and I, Ken and David, myself, <coughs> will make the argument later today about that entry point and about uh, basically hitching an economic mission to a technical object that has a national survival value so that the thing becomes self-funded. This is something you could do with solar sails if you put power production on it. So you'll, you, you'll be hearing more about that later in the day. The economics, is, it's important. It's gotta, you've got to sell it to the business people. You know, Ken, I don't want to comment on the economics. Th th this is just my opinion. Um, the U.S. <coughs> every year, uh, the budget, we're all talking about how we have to reduce the budget or find other ways to fund it, is about $3.2 trillion. That's $3,200 billion. So even if a mission to Mars were $200 billion spread over five years, that's about $40 billion a year out of $3,200 billion. Uh, to me, that's not uh, uh, an unrealistic, unaffordable number. It's a matter of priorities. And, and so I, I guess as somebody very sensitive to these things, because every time I hear NPR or anybody talk about a NASA mission, they always attach the price tag. But they don't always attach the price tag to you know, the car accident on the freeway and how much did that one mile stretch of freeway cost. Mm -hmm. you know, and so people don't have a perspective on this. So I, I guess I, I would disagree with you that it's an unaffordable amount. It's meant strictly a matter of priorities. It's really not that much money. It comes down to about one, a little over 1% per year of the US federal budget to go to Mars. If that were somehow a priority, it's imminently fundable. It's just a matter of priority. It's right. not necessarily. And it is it's unexpensive. Unexpensive. well. Yeah. Awesome. But, yeah. But, so it's just a comment about not being unaffordable. It's just a matter of priority. Right. Is there time for one more? Oh, yeah, we have time. We've got a couple of minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, along the lines of uh, your remark just now, I, uh, my collaborators and I are great advocates of electing my propulsion and launch from the ground. That they, uh, thing called Star Tram that you can bring up on the web and uh, it, it can get the cost uh, of launch down to $50 a kilogram uh, with, within existing technology now. But the important thing is that if you do that, if you develop that technology, uh, implicitly you completely change the proposition of moving people on the earth. And if you look at the mortality in the United States from automobile wrecks, every day is equivalent to one major air crash. Every day of the year, one major catastrophe of an airplane crash. And the cost of that in terms of medical care is over $600 billion a year. And so if you can get this message across to people that changing the existing paradigm building a safe transportation system with the required technologies also gets us access to space, then you have a completely different argument. You know, people don't understand risk, for example. Most a lot, a lot of risk are much, much, much greater than nuclear power. Oh, yeah. <laughs> much, much. I think we have one question over here, Ken, and then we can come. Okay, go ahead. We have time for two because we have a couple of minutes. This was kind of a question I meant to, to ask uh, Les, but being an economist, probably have some insight into this. Different propulsion methods require different fuels, and the different fuels, I guess it's energy return on energy invested. Like antimatter, for instance, we manufacture it, would require a fair amount of energy, whereas the light sails require much less, just the manufacture of the sail. Um, how big, a, this is one of the variables, how, how would you rate that as far as importance or how, uh, how important would that variable be in picking? There are a number of technologies available to travel to nearby stars, 
Yeah, how, how would you rate the, uh, I guess the amount of energy required to manufacture the fuel to go to a star? How important a variable? I think, I think a lot will depend on the quantities uh, we need. I do know, for example, in looking at terrestrial power, that's a very important consideration, the lifetime uh, energy use to produce electricity compared to what you'll actually get back. And they're actually nuclear is very good in that respect compared to coal. And I think a lot of it how much the material you, you need. For example, for space nuclear, the, the amount of material we <coughs> use is relatively small compared to what goes into nuclear power plants. So you might be willing to spend more up front to get this particular material that you absolutely uh, have to have for uh, space pow uh, power. Yeah, Carol had a question. I think it's the last one. We're, we're pretty much here because we've self-selected, we're interested in a topic, we support it. I think what we really need to be looking for in addition to technical solutions is how to convince Jagerman that it's in their self-interest to go do this. What 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 is the, the self-selected, you know, self-interest, survival, economics, whatever? What is it for me from, you know, Joe Blow on an unemployment line somewhere or somebody who's in a third world country? We have to identify a personal reason to want to support it. And how do we, how do we as a group do that? <coughs> so that then they start supporting the goals that we're talking about today? It's a very good question. It's something we need to think about to uh, help do this. That's a, that's a good topic. Why don't we solve that over lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Not to take that lightly, Carol, I, th I think if you look at the objectives of this workshop, one of the things, you mentioned we're a self-selected group. We are self-selected and selected by the people who are organized and by folks here. But I think it's because we got a diversity of, of interest, diversity of people we can reach. And I think that that kind of collaboration among this group is something we need to talk about, is how we tie in with other efforts like Tau Zero, how we tie in with Project Icarus, how we tie in to media, all those kind of things. I agree with you. And I think that, that I'd like to see us get some kind of focused internet group up where we can keep each other apprised of what we're doing, coordinate that, and try to, try to do something like that. Yeah, I think we're, yeah, we did. We did. Absolutely.